fearless leader. Uh, Harry has a career as a, a recruiter, an executive recruiter. He knows this space incredibly well. Uh, when I went through my job transition and I went through the eight week process, I had the great fortune of having Harry as my teacher. And uh, despite that horrifying experience for Harry, he didn't quit. Uh, he maintained and kept going, uh, despite having to coach people like me. Uh, but he does a phenomenal job, and he's going to share some uh, great wisdom from his uh, long career as a recruiter with you today. So we're very lucky. I'd like to welcome Harry Urschel. <laughs> Thank you. He said uh, fearless leader. I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> But uh, glad to be able to do this. Let me just uh, get my presentation up on the screen here. And uh, we'll get started today. I want to talk about resumes. I'm sure uh, everybody uh, uh, worries about do they, is the resume as effective as possible? And uh, yes, I was just going to say real quick, Skip, if you uh, Need to take off, feel free to do that. But uh, in any case, really glad for Skip. He has been incredibly faithful throughout all of our uh, events. He always shows up and as the first one there and the last one to leave, typically. And so I'm, I'm grateful for everything he does. But uh, resumes can be um, uh, fearful for a fearful thing for a lot of people because you want to make sure it's something that works, right? That, that gets you interviews and gets you along the path on, on landing a job. And I'm a big believer in having a good resume. As uh, Skip mentioned, I've been a recruiter for 34 years and uh, I've seen thousands, uh, probably tens of thousands, I couldn't tell you how many, but uh, I have a lot of uh, experience perusing resumes and a lot has changed in the last several years. And I'm a believer in having a good resume but I will say that if you're doing a good job of networking, which is the most effective way to land a new job, the resume isn't quite as important because at that point, it's just confirming what you've been talking about with the person versus being the tool to open a door for you. And realizing that when you're applying online, that you're one of dozens or perhaps hundreds of people applying for that job. And so it's really hard to have the perfect resume that's going to uh, stand out from everyone else's. That said, as I mentioned, I do believe in having a good resume. And so I want to talk about some of the things that have changed, how to think about your resume, and uh, what works and what doesn't in, in this marketplace. It's um, the first thing I think to keep in mind is as you're applying online, think about how your resume is getting received and what happens on the other end. A lot of times uh, people look at their resume and says, think, you know, it has everything in there I need it to. But how is it actually reviewed? And the more you understand that process, I think that you can be much more effective at writing your resume to get through that black box or black hole uh, of the online application system. So understanding the process, as I, as I said, you know, what happens when you send a resume to an, an employer? And we would all love to believe that somebody on the receiving end is reading our resume top to bottom and trying to figure out, hmm, how can we best use this person in our organization? <laughs> the reality, unfortunately, is very different than that. And so we'll uh, touch on that. What really happens is you apply online and it goes into a database. And it's entirely possible that um, no human eyeballs actually see your resume at all that uh, it goes in the database and periodically a uh, recruiter at that company or a hiring manager will do a keyword search to see of the people that applied over the last uh, few days or last week or whenever, uh, who has these skills and they're gonna type in some keywords that are most important for that particular job. And if your resume happens to have those words on it, your resume will pop up and they'll, they'll take a look at it. If it doesn't, they won't see your resume at all language in that database. Not a happy thought, but there again is why networking is so critically important for this process. But once it pops up, you at best get somewhere between a five and 20 second scan of your resume. That they're, they're just, they're not reading it. They're scanning up and down the page, looking for key things that they're looking for. Um, and they know what, as a recruiter or as a hiring manager, they know what they want to see on that resume. You know, certain uh, experience at, at certain companies or titles or, or type of role, certain skill sets that they need for this particular position. Um, they're, they're very adept after they've been looking at a lot of resumes. They're very adept at picking out 
uh, ones that have the experience that they're looking for. And so they scan really quickly. Now that said, if they're seeing the things they want to see on your resume, they're probably reading more and more into it. So they'll spend more time with their resume if they're seeing what they want to, to see. But if it's not, if they're not seeing it, then in five seconds or less sometimes, they can make the decision to go on to the next resume. There's always more resumes. And if there aren't enough resumes that applied online, they can always go to LinkedIn or all kinds of other Indeed and other resources to find more and more resumes. And so you have to capture their attention. They have to see fit in that period of time. Now realizing when you're applying online, all they know is the data on your resume. They don't know your personality, your work ethic, whether you're quick on your feet, all those things that are important to them in terms of the kind of person they want to hire. All they know is what's on your resume. And people can write those descriptive terms about themselves, um, but anybody can say anything they want about themselves in terms of strong work ethic and strategic thinker and all those kind of things. And most people put something like that on their resume anyway. So it doesn't set you apart by just writing it on your resume. So all you are at this point is a piece of data. And so how do you set apart your data from the others? People put an awful lot of time in developing the top part of their resume with all kinds of descriptives of what they can do. And there's nothing particularly wrong with that. But especially over the last few years with technology, there are some firms that have done eye scans of recruiters and hiring managers to see what are they actually looking at at resumes. And overwhelmingly, the first thing they jump to is work history because people can say whatever they want about what they can do, but they want to know, have you done something that's relevant to the job we're hiring for? And so they look for the most recent work history. Does it match up? If it does, then again, they'll, they'll keep looking in and look for more things on your resume. If it doesn't, they're likely to move on to somebody else because there are others that are, have applied that have been doing the same kind of job. So meaning if you're pursuing the same kind of job that you've been doing, then your odds of landing an interview are improved. But if you're um, trying to change careers and do something different, realizing the online application process is probably not going to work for you because when all they're, they're considering is data and they have five people that have been doing the same job they're looking to fill right now, and then they have one person that's trying to make a career change, it doesn't take rocket rock science to figure out who they're going to interview and who they're not. You can still land that position through networking and talking to people, but realizing that the resume itself isn't going to open that door. And they're primarily looking for reasons to reject. Now, that's it. A recruiter or a hiring manager, they want to fill this job and they want every resume to look like it's a fit because they want to get it filled and off their plate. But when they have literally dozens or hundreds of resumes, they have to narrow that down. And so they're looking for, is there anything on here that isn't as good as others I've seen and, and knock that person out so that they can narrow that pile down to the five or six people that they're actually going to screen and interview with. And so they're sorting all those resumes. Yes, I want to talk to this person. No, they're not a fit. And then they keep kind of a pile of maybes. If I get through my yeses, I'll take another look at these. But realizing that's, that's the process. And so how do you get past that? And so what you, one first thing you have to keep in mind is what does a resume do for you? And a lot of people write their resume to put everything in there to hopefully get hired for the job. But nobody makes a hiring decision based on the resume. All they're doing is trying to figure out who do I want to interview? Does this, does this person have enough skills and experience for this particular job that I want to find out more and, and uh, dig in? So you don't need to have everything that you've ever done on your resume. Put the things that are most applicable for this job for them to want to find out more. And uh, the more you understand that objective, I think it helps you thin down the resume. I looked at one yesterday that uh, had, um, it was two pages, which is good, and we'll talk about that later, but it was every single line, quarter inch um, margins along the side, not a single white space in the entire two pages. It was all just line after line after line. It was just this giant block of text that was almost impossible to read. 
And uh, because they, that person felt like they had to get as much of their career into those two pages as possible. And uh, everything that they've ever done, not effective. And so we'll talk in more detail about that. A lot of people want to run out and get hire a resume writer, and I'm not opposed to that, but I think there's great value in the process of trying to figure out how to write your own resume, because a big part of it is figuring out what are the most important things that an organization needs to know about me, and secondly, how can I say it as concisely and directly as possible, and wrestling with the, those two things really helps you articulate what you do and what you're looking for much better as well. So figuring out how to state it effectively on your resume makes you a better networker and makes you a better interviewer as well. And so there's a real value in wrestling with these things. And I get certainly that that process goes easier for some people than others. For some people trying to type up a resume is leading through their fingers on the keyboard because it's so hard and painful to do. But wrestling with that and uh, figuring out how to do it effectively is, it brings so many other great results for you as well. The other thing I find is people that can't write it well, certainly don't articulate it well, but I have found a direct correlation over the years that people that have extraordinarily long resumes can't shut up in the interview either. <laughs> they just keep rambling forever and ever. And so keep all that in mind. So what are they looking for? And as I mentioned before, is work experience is the first thing they're gonna jump to every time. And so you want to make sure your most recent positions on your resume emphasize the experience and skills that are most relevant for this job. And so even if the particular job title doesn't match up exactly or if uh, there were some differences, pick out things from your background and add them in as bullet points into your explanation of that job that are as relevant to the job you're applying to as possible. Many times people put uh, their favorite accomplishments or achievements on their resume that are impressive, but have nothing to do with the job that they're applying to. And while it may be impressive that you accomplished something, if it doesn't, if it's not related to the job you're pursuing, it's not gonna have any positive impact in terms of them wanting to talk to you about it. And so really think about what are the most important things that they're gonna care about for this job and make sure that's what's emphasized on your resume. The uh, best resource to figure out what those things are is the job description. And I'll touch on, on that as well. Obviously skills that match a job and that's kind of what we're talking about here now as well. But when they're searching for skills, they're never looking for work ethic, strategic thinker, a uh, strong communicator, what they're looking for are always going to be specifics to the technical needs of that job, whether it's uh, experience with certain software applications, processes, systems, um, whatever it is. If you're in accounting, it might be cost accounting in a manufacturing environment. If you're in uh, marketing, it might be using certain tools, uh, Photoshop or whatever else it is. But um, it's always going to be specific skills uh, that are hardwired as opposed to personality traits. Um, appropriate level of experience for a job. And so obviously if the job requires a bachelor's degree and you don't have one, it's gonna be a challenge. That doesn't mean you can't land that job, but again, your resume isn't gonna be the tool to open that door for you. You're gonna need to be talking to somebody and networking to be considered. Um, but the opposite, happens as well. If the job requires a bachelor's degree and you have a PhD, they're going to be concerned about, is this going to be really challenging enough for you? And, um, you know, is, is this uh, really at the appropriate level for the background you have? Again, you can still land that job, but the resume is not likely going to be able to, going to work to help you land that position. Related industry experience, that matters more for some sorts of positions than others. In accounting, industry often matters. If, if, uh, there's different nuances to accounting in a manufacturing environment than there is in the retail environment, et cetera. Um, there's uh, uh, a lot of roles where, you know, marketing, I think industry experience matters quite a bit in most cases. Um, there's a lot of roles, IT being one of them, where often uh, industry experience doesn't really matter. It's that making the computer systems 
uh, effective and working properly is going to be the same in a manufacturing company as it is in retail, etc. But uh, depending on what career you're in, you want to be conscious of that. The other thing they're looking for on your resume is not just do you have the related skills and experience, but were you good at your job? Did you achieve anything? Did you have any accomplishments? Did you have progression in your career? Have you, has it uh, been clear that you did more than just come in and sit there from eight to five every day? <laughs> and so having achievements, metrics, rec recognition um, of things that you accomplished on your job is really important as well. And we'll dive into a little more of that in a moment here. And then is, is it easy? easily or effectively written and easy to understand. Can, can I get a lot of information by looking down your resume? Can I understand what you're talking about? Very often people use an, a lot of uh, corporate lingo that they had at their last company. And uh, that is often not helpful if no one outside of your last company understands what that all means. And so you wanna make sure it's, it's simple for anybody to understand what it is you've done. What red flags to avoid? And this is, uh, I think, something that's important because there's a lot of people that make many of these mistakes. One is too many pages. You know, I, I think I should have pre prefaced this entire presentation with the idea that, and you probably have uh, recognized this yourself, but if you show your resume to 10 different people, you'll probably get 11 kind of contradictory opinions mm -hmm. about it, right? <laughs> and uh, it's, Everybody's uh, got their own perspective of what a resume should look like and how it should work. Um, what I have found is recruiters tend to have very similar perspectives of what resumes should be like. And the reason is they're the ones looking at resumes all day long, every day. They see the most of them. Sometimes a hiring manager, especially one maybe that hires two or three people a year, and they only see the final two or three resumes from the recruiter internally in the organization, they're not really seeing the broad spectrum of what resumes look like out there, what's really effective and what's not. And so, uh, you know, get whatever opinions you can, but at the same time, give them different weight depending on do they really, are they exposed to resumes all the time? And actually, you know what, you can do this yourself is if you're an accountant, go on to Google, and um, Google accounting resumes, and then go to the images page, and you'll see thousands of resumes. And just because it's online doesn't mean it's a good resume, right? So you're gonna see good ones and bad ones, but the more you're looking at, the more you start scanning and, and reading a little bit, you're gonna get a pretty good grasp pretty quickly of, hey, that was easy for me to get a lot of information from, or that one was really hard, I had to really take time to dive into it to, to figure anything out there and get some good best practices from a lot of other resumes you see. And so that's a, a great way to, to determine this. So my opinion is you can have your resume as long as you want, as long as it's two pages or less. <laughs> um, now that said, there are exceptions. Uh, academia, it, or they like longer resumes and, and that's uh, helpful there. Um, but for most corporate positions, more than two pages. You know, if you, if you think about them doing a five or 10 second scan of your resume, they're typically not gonna to get to a third page. And you may have wonderful information that really says a lot of great things about you on that third page, but if they never get to it, it, it does you no know, good. And that's really kind of the thinking you want throughout uh, your process of creating your resume. Are they gonna be able to see this clearly, whatever I'm writing right now? And uh, is it, are they going to be able to digest it quickly and easily? Because even though it might tell them important things about me, if it's not read, it does it, no benefit for you. And so too many pages, I think, is one big error. Too much detail, long paragraphs. Again, in that quick scan, I guarantee they're never reading a paragraph. And, you know, I talk to recruiters all the time, corporate recruiters. I talk to third-party recruiters. I talk to hiring managers all the time. Very, very few people ever actually read a resume at all. They're constantly just scanning up and down the page, picking up bits of information to, to learn about you. And in that process, paragraphs are a killer. Nobody takes the time to read a paragraph that's four or five lines long. 
And so the more you can write in shorter bullet points and in shorter phrases and, and in shorter lines, it's going to be much, much more effective. I'll show you some examples later of all the things I'm talking about. But avoid big blocks of text on your resume because it just does not get read. And so too much detail is part of that. And the too much detail factor is also a matter of um, going too deep in the weeds on your experience, you know, trying to explain everything they need to know in order to hire you versus having enough information there for them to decide they want to interview you and then be able to give more detail in the interview process instead. Too many self-descriptive adjectives. This is kind of what I was referring to before in, in terms of people fill up their resume with uh, terms about their personality traits. And uh, while it's, I'm not saying not to use that at all, at the same time, it uh, doesn't set you apart. Many people, maybe most, put all kinds of things, especially in their summary at the top of the page. You know, strong communicator with uh, dynamic personality, uh, uh, you know, with a strong work ethic, et cetera. They write all kinds of things about themselves. The catch is people that don't have those traits still put those traits on their resumes. <laughs> and so it really doesn't set you apart. Excuse me, I'm going to get a sip of coffee. Um, and so you really want to um, minimize the amount of self-descriptive adjectives that you're putting on your resume. You can demonstrate those things with uh, your experience showing what you've done, what you've achieved and accomplished and demonstrate those traits, but uh, not just state them in uh, empty words. And it takes up valuable space on your resume. If you're trying to keep your resume to two pages, you have to be really conscious of the real estate there, right? In terms of uh, how you, how much information you have and how you uh, format it so that you have the space to get as much information as you want on that. And uh, so that's one place you can cut in most cases. A uh, few facts or accomplishment. As I mentioned earlier, that they're not just looking for what have you done, but are you also good at what you do? And so having, um, metrics and accomplishments and achievements is really important. Unlikely claims of achievement is the flip side. Of that. Sometimes people, you know, somebody that's a software developer and he's part of a, a team of 20 developers working on, a, on an application says that, you know, because of my superior code, I save the company a million dollars a year on, a, on their process uh, with this application. It's really hard in most cases to quantify that for one developer on that team. It may be, and if you can explain that credibly, that's that's great. But be careful about taking too much credit because that'll be figured out pretty quickly in the interview process, and you lose credibility in that, that situation as well. A purely functional format is usually a red flag for a uh, recruiter. And what I mean by that, there's two kinds of resumes. One is a chronicle, chronological resume where you list your most recent position first and then the previous position, et cetera, throughout your career. And that's really what's preferred by 99% of recruiters and hiring managers out there. People that create a functional resume, which essentially primarily lists um, what you have capabilities to do, but it doesn't connect it to the jobs you've had, really raises eyebrows in most cases because often it's in order to hide a gap or hide uh, something that that doesn't show up well in a chronological resume. They're very usually looked on with suspicion and so I really um, um, recommend avoiding a functional resume. Now there may be some cases where it makes sense but you have to be able to connect each of the claims you make in your functional area with where you did that in your career. So you have, still have to have your employment experience on there. And then, you know, if, if at the top you're listing um, that you have experience with Oracle's, uh, Oracle applications, put in parentheses after that, which company you did that at so that they can connect the dots with what you <coughs> say you have experience with along with where you did that. And sour grapes, it's uh, so many people 
express things sometimes very subtly, sometimes not very subtly at all, <laughs> but uh, just kind of carrying that baggage about their previous employers, you know, that, uh, I, mean, I, I mean, I'll show you some examples later, but uh, some people that have wrote amazing things on their resumes, uh, expressing how their last employer didn't uh, uh, treat them fairly or didn't uh, appreciate their skills or whatever it is. Be careful about how things are coming across. And so have somebody else that you trust read through your resume and be that's willing to point those things out to you. Typos, misspellings, or poor grammar. I think this is something that has, in the last few years in particular, I see more and more mistakes on people's resumes, which is really uh, um, a shame. You know, I think back 30 years ago, when the process used to be you typed up your resume and then you had to take it to a copy shop or a printer to print off 100 copies for yourself. And then you get it home and realize that, oh my gosh, there's a typo here. I think people were a little more forgiving back then because they realized that, you know, those things happen and that, you know, once it's printed, it's, you've got money invested and it's a big deal to fix it. There's less tolerance for that now. Now, this is subjective. Some people don't get upset about that uh, or, or, care about uh, misspellings or typos or grammar mistakes. But I do know a lot of hiring managers or recruiters that if they find an error on the resume, you're just gonna knock it out because if you think about it, your resume is supposed to be your best foot forward. This is your best work to, sh to showcase who you are and what you represent. And if your best foot forward has mistakes in it, what's your average work like? And so, you know, obviously with a computer, you can fix those things on the fly before you send it out. You should be able to find them. And you have to have somebody else proofread it for you or proofread it very carefully yourself. So much of the time, I do this all the time. I can read what I wrote and uh, my, my mind is filling in the blanks and I don't recognize the mistake there because I know what I meant, but I'm not really looking at what, what it actually says on be careful about this because this can knock you out for a reason that you know has something to do with your background. And a lot of people get knocked out in your process. So resume don'ts is just a little bit of a humorous interlude. I don't know if online you can read these. I'll, I'll read this uh, real quick. These are lines that were actually taken off of actual resumes. And uh, um, don't do this kind of stuff. <laughs> Somebody wrote, uh, please don't misconstrue my 14 jobs as job hopping. I've never quit a job. <laughs> that doesn't, uh, that's probably not a good thing. The company made me a scapegoat, just like my three previous employers. <laughs> Talk about sour grapes. <laughs> Responsibilities include checking customers out. <laughs> probably a retail, but uh, <laughs> you will develop and recommend an annual operating expense budget. <laughs> With that, not uh, being careful about the typos. Dealing with customers' conflicts that arouse. Probably not the best grammar or the way they meant to say that. Uh, terminating after, terminated after saying it would be a blessing to be fired. Might be, but probably not what you should put on your resume. And being in trouble with the law, I move quite frequently. <laughs> That's uh, probably not an uh, accomplishment you want on your resume either. These are lines that actually came off of resumes. I remember once this was many years ago now, but uh, I was uh, working on a position and I was checking a reference of somebody and um, didn't realize that they had different last names, but I didn't realize this person's one reference was actually his mother and uh, got her on the phone. And once I connected the dots that this was their mother, I'm trying to end the call rather quickly because that's not gonna be a, a legitimate reference for us. But at the tail end of the conversation, just as we we're about to say goodbye, she says, I hope he gets this job. Then he'll finally stay out of trouble. <laughs> Thanks, <Mom. laughs> she, He didn't get the job. But uh, careful about uh, how you express things on most days. So what is the best format? And this is critical because I think a lot of times people see someone else's resume and think, wow, that's a great looking resume and I can get a lot of information off of it. And uh, I want that for me. But there is no one best format for everyone. And, and depending on your career, what field you're in, what your uh, career history is, 
it should look quite a bit different than one format. There is no one size fits all format. Um, you know, Microsoft Word has a resume format that uh, people use pretty regularly. And there's nothing inherently bad about it, except it tries to fit everybody's career into one specific format. So a graphic artist should have a very different looking resume than a salesperson or an accountant. Um, if someone in IT, IT resumes tend to be unique compared to other fields. And uh, somebody that worked 30 years at one company should have a very different looking resume than somebody that was changing jobs every few years. And so you have to take all those things in consideration and figure out what's the best way to uh, represent my career history in the most possible way possible. And so just because you like somebody else's format that worked for their career doesn't mean that it's necessarily the best format for your career. And so again, um, I think uh, I mentioned here, get ideas from an internet search, as I mentioned earlier. You know, if you're in, uh, um, if you're a Unix systems administrator uh, in, in IT, Google Unix resumes on, on Google and, and then look on the uh, images field and you'll see all kinds of resumes. And again, you'll see good ones and bad ones, but if you look at enough of them, you'll get a pretty good sense of, yeah, that was pretty effective at getting information across that was, and you'll get some ideas. The other thing is you can, resumes aren't copyrighted material. If somebody words their experience really well and you like it and it's, and it's applicable to you, don't hijack somebody else's uh, experience. That's not true for you. But uh, if, if uh, you get some good ideas on how other people worded things on their resume, use that for yours as well. Modify it appropriately or whatever, but um, get some good ideas from other people's resumes too. Um, one of the things that has changed certainly in the last 10, 12 years is the idea of having an object objective at the top of your resume. That used to be kind of required and, and what everybody is expected to see and what is it that you're pursuing. The reality is an objective is almost always something like uh, uh, an opportunity at a company to continue to expand my skills and, and grow in my career and make a positive contribution. Well, that's all well and good, but that's what you want. It doesn't say anything about what you offer the company and what, how you solve their problems or what you're going to do for them. And so an objective is really considered dated at this point, and you don't want to have that out there. Instead, using a heading and summary points um, is much more effective. And I'll show you, again, examples here in, in a few minutes. But um, don't get gimmicky on your resume either. Um, I've seen people put um, uh, <coughs> emojis and, and uh, all kinds of other characters on their resume to, you know, with the idea that it's going to stand out that way. Well, yeah, it will stand out, but it won't be remembered in a positive way. <laughs> you know, they'll remember. So back many years ago, and I've been recruiting for a long time, but when people actually mailed their resume into you by the postal service versus uh, email, you used to get all kinds of things. People sending uh, perfumed uh, paper. I remember one where you opened it up and it kind of popped open and a bunch of glitter came out. Um, you know, people using all kinds of uh, strange uh, um, fonts and, and uh, 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 pictures in, on their resumes. All those things I remember and I can tell you about them, but uh, they didn't get the job. <laughs> it's not, not inherently a bad thing to stand out, but it's got to be, it's got to stand out in a professional, positive way, not just in a gimmicky way. So don't put winding bonds on your resume. Uh, some of those crazy, crazier things are less common now since everything's electronic instead of sent through the mail, but uh, still sometimes see some things that uh, are not appropriate. And you know, one of the things is picture, and I don't, I don't see pictures on people's resumes often, but once in a while I get one. And it's, there's no good explanation for this, but your LinkedIn profile essentially serves as a resume as well. And it's bad form to have a picture on your resume, but it's bad form not to have a picture on your LinkedIn profile. There's no logic behind that. I couldn't tell you why, why it's okay for one and not the other, but it is. That's, that's the reality. Of it. And so be appropriate in, in that situation as well. 
So here are a couple of examples. This was, and this is like it, it, um, the top half of a uh, resume, and yeah, not the whole resume, obviously, but this is years ago was considered a very good resume. And, uh, and it would be considered a very dated and bad resume today. And so let me point out some differences. The second version, and I'll point out specifics on, on both of these here in a moment, but uh, the second version has all the same information as the first one, but in much more effective and current and readable form. And so again, I'll point this out. One is Times New Roman font. It used to be conventional wisdom. Always send your resume in with Times New Roman font because um, that's what is most professional and that's what the uh, uh, applicant tracking systems are looking for, etc. The funny part about that is today you want your resume and almost anything else besides Times New Roman font. Don't send it to Times New Roman font, which uh, is you know minor detail perhaps, but Times New Roman font looks dated, and it just does, and, and it's perceived that way. And you want your resume to look current and, and uh, forward. And so that's one factor. The other part of that is the applicant tracking systems are not um, selective anymore. They can read any kind of font, probably not wingdings, <laughs> so <laughs> but uh, um, they're not, uh, they don't have the sensitivity that they used to have. Um, applicant tracking systems are much more sophisticated today than they were even five or seven years ago. And so avoid that. Secondly, you don't need to give your address any longer. Um, it's just not necessary on a resume. It takes up space and you're, you want to preserve space as much as possible on your resume to be able to get information in that you want. And so you don't need that. Now, I would say, it does help um, to have at least, and you can see that here, at least your city. So if you're applying, if you live in Eden Prairie and you're applying to a position at 3M in Oakdale, you know, that's probably not gonna help you, but uh, if you're applying to something close, that does help you. And so it uh, makes a, uh, a difference there to let them know that you're nearby because if it's a short commute for you, they're gonna feel more comfortable about uh, considering you for the role of I know it's not long you. Um, the other part of that is growing numbers of people all the time. I mean, it's pretty regular these days that their phone number is from out of state because they have their cell phone and they used to live in Chicago, but now they're here and, or wherever. And uh, if it's not a local area code, then the question comes up, is this person local or do they need relocation expenses or are they looking to to you know, relocate, which makes that a riskier hire. And so, especially if you have uh, out of town or out of state area code on your phone number, make sure you have a local uh, city that you can send a resume as well. But all you need is your city contact, inf or your contact information, phone number and email address. I get resumes every now and then that has no contact information on it. They might have a big, great background, but if I, don't know how to reach them, that's, uh, that's a problem. And uh, it's amazing to me that people do that. So be careful. Secondly, as I mentioned, you don't have to have it, you know, on four lines or multiple lines on your resume. If you're trying to conserve space, stretch it out onto one line and it saves you several lines uh, that you can use more effectively on your resume otherwise. Talk about uh, your own example of, of uh, an objective. Seeking a senior project manager opportunity with a growing dynamic company where I can further develop my skills and continue to advance my career. Well, that's wonderful for you, but what does that do for the company? <laughs> Nothing, right? And so just the idea of an objective altogether, drop it, it's uh, considered dated these days. The uh, more effective option is, first of all, put a heading on your resume of generally what you wanna do, not necessarily specifically, the title that you're uh, applying to. A project manager is fairly generic, um, and so that's fine. But if you're applying for um, a sales representative position, you don't necessarily need to put sales representative as your heading on your resume, you put sales professional or something a little more generic. But the purpose is that 
as they pick up your resume, they can instantly see, are you in the ballpark of what we're looking for? And the reason for that is companies get, you know, the online postings and application systems are a blessing and a curse. The blessing is you find out about much more, many more opportunities than you've ever been able to find out about before. They're all posted easily, easy to find. The downside is more people than ever are applying for jobs. And there are a ton of people out there that apply to anything and everything versus whether they're remotely um, qualified for the job or not. And so there are people applying for jobs that aren't, have, that have zero experience for the position they're applying to. And the hopes for them that if I just throw enough out there, something's gonna stick. That almost never works for them. But, um, I, I remember I rarely have ever posted jobs online as a third party recruiter, but there have been a few times. And I remember one, I posted it. We were looking for a corporate controller for a company, which is the highest level accounting person in an organization. And um, I was, I got, a, I got resumes from a truck driver, from a plumber, from um, all kinds of people that had no appropriate training or experience whatsoever. And I'm trying to think, to get in their mind a little bit, what prompted you to apply for this corporate controller uh, position that required an MBA and, and uh, many years of, of appropriate experience. But that does happen, and that's what you, you need to be able to rise above. And so having a header really helps them at least to know if you're in the ballpark and they'll spend a little more time. Secondly, they have a, on this, uh, Older version, there's a summary paragraph, but again, it's a paragraph that is not likely to get read in the first place. And then it starts off with driven strategic thinker with a strong work ethic and excellent communication skills, 20 years of experience as a business analyst, product manager, et cetera. That first part is virtually meaningless or it's so unimportant, but takes up a lot of space on your resume. And plus the fact that again, as, as a paragraph, it's not likely to get read at all any so, oops, go this direction. You can have um, a short line, you know, a couple of lines, uh, senior project leader with proven results and experience in delivering information technology initiatives that achieve desired objectives and improve processes and results for the organization. You know, that is a little more targeted to what they're trying to accomplish or hire for, but then break down your experience that you want them to know right off the top about you into something that's easy to read as you're scanning down the page that can pick things out quickly and easily in, in little bullet points like that versus reading, having to read through a lot of text. And you can adjust as you're customizing your resume to make sure that it gets noticed for the job you're applying to. You can change the, that list of experience there to be more relevant for the job that you're, you're after. Then for their experience section, they have uh, things broken down into bullet points, which is good, but it's they're all crammed together. And this is probably one of the most common mistakes people make is they might have five or six bullet points or more uh, listed for a particular job they're pursuing, but it's all, all the bullet points are crammed together. If you cover the bullets themselves, it's just one big block of text. And so they're going to notice that what's written in the top one or two bullet points. But I guarantee they're not noticing or reading anything in those fourth, fifth, and sixth bullet points. And so putting some white space in between in order to make each one stand out better makes a huge difference in terms of them being able to get information off your resume. Again, the, the goal is if they're only gonna scan down the resume, you want them to be able to see the most important things about your experience as quickly and easily as possible. And so you can bold face certain words within your, your descriptions as well that are most relevant for the job. So if the job description might say um, uh, project manager and requirements include managed uh, teams of 10 people or more, uh, managed budgets of uh, half a million dollars or more, you can both face those relevant items, teams of 15 people, budgets of $1 million, have to have agile project methodology experience, agile there, bold face, as they're scanning down, those things are gonna jump out. They can check off, you know, do you have this experience, I know requirements, this experience, et cetera. They can see that quickly and easily. 
that's a highly effective way of customizing your resume for the jobs that you um, are pursuing. The um, other factor, you know, I think if, it is so important to customize your resume because, again, you need them to be able to connect the dots between your experience and the job as quickly and easily as possible. And so really take some time to examine that uh, job description. The requirements section, well, let me back up. How do job descriptions get created? And for most companies, especially large companies, smaller companies, more of a hit and miss in this process, but they at some point created job descriptions for every role within that organization. And a hiring manager that wants to add somebody on their team or replace somebody, they reach out to HR or the recruiter, and that person uh, pulls up the job description that they have on file for that particular role. And typically, that recruiter will go to the hiring manager and say, you know, here's our job description. Is this what you're trying to fill? And the hiring manager will look through it and say, yeah, this is it. But I, for this particular role, I'd also like them to have X experience, Oracle, or whatever, or Agile experience, or whatever it is that they need. And maybe they list two or three things that they'd like to see in addition to the standard job description. Typically, not always, but typically what happens then is that recruiter will add those requirements as the first few bullet points on the requirements or qualification section for that job. So, you know, the job might list 10 things that they're looking for in terms of requirements, but really those first two, three, or four position, uh, bullet points are going to be the most important ones. And so I've had people tell me, I can't believe I didn't get an interview out of their 10 uh, requirements. I had seven of them. Yeah, but you had the bottom seven, not the top three. And so that's what's critical in this case. So pay attention to what those are and make sure those first few couple of bullet points are very evident on your resume. As you're scanning down the page, they can connect the dots easily to see, yes, you have that experience. And so that's where bold facing comes in. Um, and you may change up the bullet points you have or, or change the order if the most relevant skills they're looking for are the fourth bullet point on your list of experience from your last job move that to one of the top two bullet points so that it's, it jumps out better um, i have seen people and i think this is a good idea they'll create a master resume that might be four or five pages long that have bullet points you know like crazy to describe all their experience but as they're getting a resume ready to send in, they actually assemble it from that master resume. So they're only going to send in a two-page resume, but they're going to pull the most relevant <coughs> points together to put onto, onto that two-page resume. That way you don't have to reinvent the wheel or completely rewrite things every time you're applying to a new job. You have the material there, you just have to assemble it appropriately. But um, this is some ideas. Se uh, line separators between sections of your resume again helps in the scanning process it helps them uh, attract their eyes to certain parts of the resume and it makes it easier to read again too um, i like to use the term it's better to use short substantive sound bites i definitely can't say that 10 times quickly but uh, it's better to use short substantive sound bites rather than long lines or paragraphs you don't have to write in complete sentences for it. You can just put a quick phrase um, that uh, expresses what you're trying to get across in terms of your experience. It's um, uh, so much easier for them, again, in that scanning process, just to catch a, you know, a few quick words than it is to, to read the whole thing. And you know, in this example with the bold-faced words, they're probably not gonna be reading the full two lines here. They're just going to notice that and, and in their mind, go check, you know, that's what I'm looking for. And they keep moving on to see what else they find. And so, again, making it easy. The other key is, as I mentioned earlier, is it's not just your experience. They want to know have you accomplished anything? Are you good at what you do? And so, as much as possible to phrase things or add additional lines that. Um, express your achievements in those things is, is important too. So achieve budget goals, 
managing those projects, uh, minimize scope creep. If you have specifics, um, you know, especially if you're in sales, the elephant in the room question on hiring any salesperson is, can this person actually close deals? You might have great product knowledge. You might understand the, the sales process for that industry. You might have great experience working with other uh, companies they're interested in. But if you can't actually close sales, it doesn't do them any good. And, and whether it gets asked or not, um, the thing they're looking for is, have you moved the needle? Were you able to increase sales for your region or for um, the, the product line that you're representing? And so it's critically important to have metrics on your resume if you're a salesperson. It's uh, very important for a number of other kinds of fields too. But if you can't have specific numbers and metrics, you at least want to express things in a way to show that you've achieved some things and made progress. Too many people just list the responsibilities. So again, plenty of white space is critically important to make it easy to read. Um, uh, your experience section should be probably high. I mean, you, can, you certainly should have some kind of summary at the top, but uh, don't bury your experience section to the second page. I mean, it, 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 I mean, I guarantee they're going to jump to your experience section first when they look at your resume, but uh, you want to make it accessible for them. Um, education, I don't have it as on the example here, but you, if you, if you're more, if you're a, a recent college grad and you just came out of college in the last two years, then you want to have education at the top of your resume because it's still very relevant at that point. I mean, after about two or three years, what you got your degree in, where it was, your GPA, those things are really not as relevant. It's important they have it, and they're going to check at some point do you have the appropriate level of education, but it's not going to matter. And so then it should go, it's not going to matter in terms of uh, um, your specifics for this job. They're much more concerned with what have you done in the last few years in your career. And so then you can put your education at the bottom of your resume. The exception is if you went to an Ivy League school or you went to a school that is very relevant for the industry or company you're pursuing. Um, I had somebody in one of my classes one time is he had 20 some years of experience, but uh, he went to Princeton. That kind of thing, I have had people from Harvard, Yale, and et cetera. That should be at the top of your resume throughout your career. Those, that kind of an education is a bell ringer throughout your career. And so you want them to be aware of that. I know uh, clients of mine, in fact, um, I had a client that uh, hired somebody that uh, I didn't think was all that great of a fit for the job. We showed it to them, but he had a Harvard MBA and they just wanted that on their team, even though he didn't necessarily fit the job very well at all. And, uh, you know, that's their decision, but it is a bell ringer throughout your career. So if you have that kind of education, make sure that's, that's at the top. Um, Finally, there's uh, Susan Whitcomb writes a lot of good books on job search, and she has one called the ABCs of a Good Resume. And I, I like this just because it's very simple and it gets uh, to a lot of the things we were talking about. A for accuracy, honest facts of your responsibilities and achievements. Nothing will torpedo your chances of landing a job faster than if they get if they perceive that you're embellishing your experience, if they feel like you're overstating what you've done or, or uh, um, claiming to have done things that you didn't really do. And these days, it's easier than ever to find that out. What is very common, which most people I don't think really realize, but backdoor references are extremely common. But, you know, you worked at XYZ company and that person says, oh, I know some, if the hiring manager thinks, oh, I know some people there and they look up on LinkedIn who they know at that company. It's very common for them to pick up the phone and shoot an email over, hey, I'm considering hiring this person. I understand they work there. What can you tell me about them? And, you know, overinflating your experience on your resume can get found out very quickly and easily and often does. And so don't do it. Uh, now, that said, state things positively as much as possible. I think sometimes people underrate the experience they've actually had. And so you want to make sure that 
what you truly have done is stated as positively as you can. Just don't uh, overinflate. Um, brevity, as I mentioned, short substantive lines, be paragraphs every time is uh, paragraphs just do not get read. And this is true on your LinkedIn profile too. One, one difference between LinkedIn and, and um, resumes is where I really emphasize that no more than two pages for your resume, your LinkedIn profile can be as long as you want. It, it, you know, if you were to print it out, it, I don't care if it's 14 pages long, but you still want it very easy to get a lot of information from by from a quick scan. Nobody reads LinkedIn profiles either. They're just scanning up and out, excuse me, looking for keywords and, and information that they're looking for. And so same principle there, no paragraphs, keep it in bullet points, put white space between your bullet points, and uh, short substantive sound bites are better than long sentences at a time. And clarity, as I mentioned many times, they have to be able to connect the dots quickly and easily between what they're looking for in their job description and the experience you have listed on your resume. So those things have to jump off the page, whether you bold face them, whether you put them first in your list of bullets or um, however else you want to emphasize those things. But, you know, so often we look at our resume, our own resume, and I know what my career has been. And it's obvious to me when I'm looking at it that everything on that job description is listed there. But it's listed as the fifth bullet point out of a, out of a list of uh, 10 of them. Um, it's listed, everything is kind of buried. It's clear to me that it's there, but they're not gonna take the time to dig into it to find all of that. And so you, it has to be obvious to anybody else that makes up your resume as well. So that's it. I um, hope that gives you some perspective of what works and what doesn't. I want to kind of finish up with what I started with in terms of I, I'm a believer in having a good resume, but if you're doing a good job of networking, a resume, quality of your resume isn't that important. It's uh, at that point, it's just confirming the things you've talked about with someone versus being the tool to open up a door. And I have never seen a resume that's so great that it's going to open up a door every time. It just doesn't exist. A lot of people have good resumes out there. A lot of people have bad resumes out there. The experience you have speaks louder than, than uh, the format and, and uh, information or I mean, the uh, quality of how well your resume was written. And so it's still going to matter when they're looking online at online applications. They're just comparing your data to the other data they receive. And if your background fits really well and compared to others, you're going to get an interview. And if, it, if there's others that look better than yours, you, you may not get an interview. And so you want them to see your relevant experience as quickly and easily as possible to connect those dots. But you can't overcome a bad background with a great resume. And so often I, I uh, have people that are trying to do that, and that's not going to happen. Networking is much more effective where you can overcome when they see the personality fit and how you, you can work well with others, how you your passion for what you're pursuing and your curiosity and still want to learn and develop. Those are things that are attractive that will overcome a background that might not fit so well. And, uh, but they only learn that from a conversation with you. They can never learn that from the information you have on the rest. So that's it. I uh, hope that was helpful and uh, glad that you were able to participate this morning. And uh, you can email me anytime on our website, any of the email addresses that are on there, primarily info at uh, mncrossroads.com. Those come directly to me and I'm glad to uh, help or answer any questions you may have at any time. But uh, thanks for joining us this morning and uh, please do join us for upcoming events. We have, uh, we are going to be reverting to online only webinars for the rest of this year, certainly. And then we're going to kind of revisit after the first of the year to see about reinstating uh, in person meetings. But uh, our next webinar will be the first Thursday in November, which I believe is November 4th, but I can't recall exactly the date, but I believe it's uh, November 4th. And that's going to be with George Murray, 
who uh, wrote a book called Hired, How to Cut Your Job Search Time in Half. And he's going to be talking about seven tips to successful networking. Uh, I have a great deal of respect for, I know George personally pretty well, and great deal of respect for how he's learned to network effectively. And he's a guy that was not a networker and is at heart an introvert and had to figure it out. And he did it exceptionally well. And so I really encourage you to check that out. That'll be online. You can go to our website, to the seminars page to see details and pre-register. And uh, it'll be on November 4th to uh, watch online and look forward to seeing you there. Thanks again. Yeah. Turn this on.